We're returning to our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you, falsely, for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Amen. Amen. That's the verse we're going to look at today. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And we're going to be study, studying from our Bibles today. So if you don't have a Bible, I'd encourage you to get one back there. We're going to be studying the Word of God. So this is a time to actively open your Bibles and study the Word of God. Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. Ye are the salt of of the earth. This is what we're studying today. Our Lord Jesus looks at us on that mountain and he points at us and he says, you are the salt of the earth. Look at what else he says in verse 13. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot by men. I'll pray once more. Lord, we need your power, and we need your ability to discern what this text is saying. So Lord, please come to us. Please baptize us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Please examine our hearts for sin and cleanse us with your precious blood today. Cleanse us afresh in your blood, Lord. Wash us in your blood. Teach us, please, this one thing, Lord. What does it mean that we are the salt of the earth? Amen. Amen. Our Lord says, you are the salt of the earth. best meal I ever had was when I was working in a, an archaeological dig in Athens for one summer, and they paid for us to go over there to my school, and it was right near where Paul preached on the Areopagus on Mars Hill, right near there, they had us digging but it's not really digging, you're digging with a toothbrush, basically. It's like a little tiny brush, and you're just brushing away bits of dirt so that you never miss anything. <clears throat> digging in what was called the ancient Agora, the, the marketplace of Athens. And we would have to wake up at around 4.30, be out the door at 5.30, run down the hill to the marketplace in Athens. Um, to get to that site to start brushing off that dirt all day because you want to start working when the sun's not so hot, right? The sun would get hotter and hotter and hotter and I think we'd work till about 11.30. And there, there was one day, the second day we were there, when our boss said to us, go right there and order the salted pork. And he made all of us go get salted pork. No matter what our dietary restrictions are, he said, get that or die. 
And so we all went to the, that little shop, and there was just a piece of pita bread around this pork. And you could see these big diamonds of sea salt on the pork. And it was the best, best meal I've ever had. Why? Because when you're working in the hot sun, if you don't have salt, what happens? You lose your water. You lose your water. You can't retain water. You can't be hydrated. So he wasn't just telling us to get lunch. He was on a rescue mission for our bodies. He was saying, you need salt. And I really, it was the best tasting, best meal I've ever had. The simplest and the best. There's an ancient phrase, as old as the histories of Pliny and all those people. Sine sale, vita humana, non potest degere. It means in ancient Latin, without salt, human life is not able to sustain itself. So even the ancient physicians knew, without a little bit of sodium, you're not going to retain any water. Without salt, human life is not able to sustain itself. What does our Lord say right here in verse 13? You, Christians, are the salt of the earth. We could think of it this way. Without us, the earth is not able to sustain itself. This is a really, really important idea. So I hope we can study the scriptures together today. And we're just going to answer this simple question first. What is salt? And then second, we're going to ask, are you salty? Are you a salty dog, Christian? And third, we're going to ask, do you fear losing your saltiness? Those are the three questions that this text proposes. What is salt? Let's start with that. What is salt? And I want to throw out some key passages here. I think this will enliven your Bible reading. As you go back to the scriptures, you're going to find every, I don't know, 10 chapters or so, there's salt, salt, salt. And it's just coming up all throughout the scriptures. And it's incredible. Three things the salt tends to do in the scriptures. Let's study this together. First, it prevents rot. Salt prevents rot. The first appearance of salt. Can anyone think of what it is back in Genesis? Genesis chapter 19. Think back there. You imagine that scene? Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. God is judging it. He's sending fire and brimstone on that city. He's saying, you all have been sodomites. You all have been prideful. I'm sending my judgments against you, right? And he tells Lot's family, come out of there. Lot comes out and he takes his family out. And what happens to Lot's wife? She turns to salt. She looks back. And God turns her into a pillar of salt. Boom! Salt! What does that first appearance of salt indicate to us? Holiness. Amen. And God was looking at Lot's wife and he was saying, Oh no you don't. You're done for. You stop right there. She was tempted to go back to sin. She was tempted to go back to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, stop. So that's the first way we can think about salt. It, it says, stop. You will not go any further. It's a preventative. It's an antiseptic. It stops the evil. Martin Lloyd-Jones says it prevents putrefaction. That's this tendency in the world for everything to putrefy, to rot, to get worse. And God gives Christians as salt to say, stop, go no further. Here's another scripture verse, Mark 9, verse 49. Jesus says, for everyone shall be salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. What's he saying there? He's again pointing out to us that salt has to do with holiness. It has to do with fire. 
It has to do with something that's absolutely essential when we offer offerings to the Lord. Amen? So think about what just happened the last two years with COVID. COVID comes. Floods and floods of fear come on the world. Everything shuts down. How did the Christian serve as a preventative in that time? Well, we have people like John MacArthur. We have churches like ours and CFF. And it's not to take any pride in ourselves whatsoever. But there was a Christian force, was there not, that was saying, Stop it, world. Stop being so foolish. We're not shutting down our churches. We're not just hiding in fear from this. Right? And it was... In, in large part, some very loud Christian voices, especially in Canada with those pastors, who were preventatives to the rot of anxiety and fearfulness that was coming upon the world. Do you all see that? Ye are the salt of the earth. A second thing that salt does. So it, it prevents rot. Second, it preserves what is good. It preserves what is good. A very mysterious reference you might want to write down is Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 4, where you hear about newborn babies. Interesting to think about this, as some of us are expecting babies. In Ezekiel's time, with a newborn baby, to clean the baby as it comes out of the womb, they would salt it. And I was looking into that. It's hard to figure out exactly what that's about. But it's some sense that they used like a soft uh, sodium to clean off the, the film and the junk that was on the baby, right? I think now we use, what, blankets, swaddling blankets for all of that? So think of that. That's a preservative. The baby in Ezekiel 16.4 is, is salted to keep him clean. So there's something beautiful, something new, and something fresh. And salt is used to preserve. Isn't that beautiful? Let's look together for this preservative function at Leviticus chapter 2. Leviticus chapter 2. And this is maybe the, one of the mo most major salt references in the scriptures. Turn to Leviticus chapter 2 for a minute. I really want you to see this. Here, Moses is the author. And he is talking about the types of offering that are accepted by the Lord. Look at Leviticus chapter 2 verse 11. This is fascinating. And, and, and you all have to get this, that this is not just an Old Testament principle. Uh, our Lord repeats this principle in Mark chapter 9 very clearly. So we don't want to just say, oh, that's Old Testament. This is stuff that's still alive for us today. These are the words of Jesus. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 11 says, No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? If you're going to offer something to the Lord, he says, no leaven. What does that mean spiritually? It means nothing that puffs up. If you're going to offer something to the Lord, don't put any yeast in there. Anything that would make it puff up. And then what does he say? For ye shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in any offering of the Lord made by fire. No leaven, no honey. What does that mean? No sweetness. No rot. No sugar coating. Don't add any sweetness in there. And then what does he say in verse 13? And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. And now look, he repeats that three times to emphasize it. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. And here's a third time. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt so what is Moses saying back there he's setting up a principle in the Old Testament with everything you give God think about it Christian 
When you come to church, when you pray, when you do a good work, when we go to move this church in the next month, should you put leaven in there? Should you puff it up with your pride and say, ha ha, I did that? Moses is saying, no leaven. <coughs> should we sugarcoat it and say, oh yeah, everything's good and I'm just putting honey on top and I'm always happy and start to lie about our offerings we give to the Lord? No. But then he says, salt. Not leaven, not honey, but always salt. What does salt signify here? Look one more time in verse 13. First of all, it seasons. And that first thing, it seasons. And then he says, it's the salt of the covenant of thy God. That's really important. That means there's some connection between salt and faithfulness. Between salt and covenant agreements. It's something that preserves. It's something that keeps that agreement. And then again, he repeats, with all thine offerings. Salt is an always. We always need salt. Okay, so that second meaning of salt is this. It preserves what's good. It ensures that what we're doing remains. Just two more thoughts I have on this. What I've noticed in our church and in Portland as we go on, as we seek to combat the forces of evil in Portland, have you not noticed that the most powerful thing ever is a faithful Christian? Yes. I, I, I'm just wanting to say that almost every hour. The more I go on in ministry, the more we go on as a church, the most powerful thing we could give this city is just faithful Christians who just keep pressing on and I think that's this preservative aspect of salt. It's like faithful, covenantal, not going anywhere, preserving. There's been this flood also of transgenderism in our society, no? Yes. And think of how we work as Christians to preserve what is good in the midst of that transgender flood. We're, we're seeing men who call themselves women, and then women who call themselves men. And you know what you notice? Is that the men become more ugly, and the women become more ugly. And everything becomes confused. And everything becomes sort of just rotten and insipid. <clears throat> but what do we do as Christians? And salt. We say men are men, women are women, men marry women, they produce babies, we raise families. Do you all see what I'm saying here? I just want you to get that point, right? Yeah. Think about that when fl this flood of transgenderism, that ungodliness comes in. We as Christians are going to be some of the only ones who go on and say, no, a man is a man, a woman is a woman, they should get married, they should make babies, right? That's our preservative function as the salt of this earth. A third thing about salt Salt enhances. Salt brings out the taste. And this is so important. Two more scripture references. Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So the Bible also talks of salt as seasoning things. The world is insipid, is flavorless. The world is gray. The world is lacking in interest. And along come the Christians, and we need to season the world. We need to be there to bring out the taste. Let me just give you one illustration of that. 
when I was first saved, and I was talking to my pastor in Toronto, he had invited me to a pregnancy care center thing. And I was still making all these worldly arguments to him about abortion. And I was just saying, but it's, it's not that sinful, right? And I was making these arguments, but I could feel myself just floating in this grayness of worldly arguments, because I had been saved. I could feel like this isn't really going anywhere, but I, I don't really want to go to that event. And then Osman just said to me, yes, okay, but ultimately, babies are being murdered. Right? right. And it was like he just sprinkled a little salt on me. Right? And he seasoned all of my thought. And from then on, it just clarified everything. It was like all of my questions just went away, right? I hope you're all hearing me on that. This is really important. Because the world only has grayness to offer. Just dryness, nothingness. We need to come along as Christians and say, we're going to season it. We're going to spread some salt there. We're going to remind people that God made this earth. That abortion is murder. That right, we just say these simple truths and it sprinkles salt everywhere. I believe one of the reasons I grew up so much wanting to kill myself, so much wanting to die, is that I didn't know anything about Christian truth. There were no Christians around me who were just sprinkling salt, saying, You know, there are answers, there is goodness, there is evil, right. You need that Christian influence. And we should think about that as we go to raise children. Because we might say, what if my child isn't, isn't saved until he's 20 or 30 or 40? What are we doing as Christians? Even if he's not saved until then, we're sprinkling salt in their lives before then. We're giving this preserving, preventing, and what? Enhancing flavor to their lives. And you have to trust as parents that that will hem them in. That will make their lives better. That will make them less prone to, to depression and to all these things that the world wants to ravage them with. You all see that? So what is salt? If we wanted to say it in one word, it is the Christian's duty to prevent, to preserve, and to enhance in the world. It's the Christian's duty to prevent, to preserve, and to enhance in the world. Amen? Amen. Maybe we've Amen. gone a little long on that point, but I want to, to bring that out for you. Salt is such an amazing concept in the scriptures. Now go back with me to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13, please. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And here's my second question for you. We've said what salt is. Now let's ask, are you salty? Are you salty? Look at verse 13 again. Our Lord looks at us and says, Ye are the salt of the earth. Let's just notice a few things about this verse. First of all, He's telling us what we are. We don't need to necessarily become salt. We are salt. If we've been saved, this is true of us. We have those functions in our life. Second, note this in this verse. Ye are the salt of the earth. That's really important. He's basically saying we are the only salt of the earth. He's not saying you and the Republicans are the salt of the earth. He's not saying you and the Daily Wire are the salt of the earth. He's saying you Christians and you only are the salt of the earth. Isn't that a vital thing to know? Have you all noticed that with, for example, with resisting homosexuality, with calling homosexuality sin, a few years ago, conservatives and Republicans would have been with the Christians on that, right? Yeah. 
Now, conservatives and Republicans are going the other way on that. And I would predict to you that in the next five to ten years, Christians will be the only ones who are holding down that fort. Do you all see that? We are the salt of the earth and the only salt of the earth. We can't expect anyone else to be the salt of the earth. Yes. Just a few other things. Note also that if he's saying this, then he's implying that the earth needs us. The earth is rotting. The earth is putrefying. The world is going bad, and we need to be there as the salt. What else is he implying right here? He's implying stuff about our relationship to the world and to the earth. We need to be in the world. We need to be in the earth so that we're having that salt function, right? right. And then here's one more really, really important thing. Look, he doesn't say... You are the salt of the earth, and go make the whole world salt. Although we do want to evangelize and make as many Christians as possible, right? But this is really amazing. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Not go make the whole world salt, but stay in the world and make sure the world doesn't rot. That's what he's saying. This should also really encourage us. Because he's not saying, make everything salt. He's saying, even if you are small, and we just have a few grains of salt in this church, what? You can be very effective if you're salty, right? Yeah. There's a scientific principle called cellular infiltration. And it's on this principle that salt works. Have you ever wondered why you can take a whole... Uh, vat of soup, right? And you put this much salt in it, and the whole thing gets salted, doesn't it? Yes. That's called cellular infiltration. You just need a little bit of salt, and it makes the whole thing salty. Again, that ought to encourage us, it encourages me at least, that we're not just about numbers, we're about saltiness. If we get more salty among the few of us, Get 10 more people who are salty with us. We can just salt all of Portland. You see that? Yeah. I love that. Final question. Do you fear losing your savor? Look at our verse again. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Here, our Lord gets sort of, it's a little haunting, isn't it? Okay, all that we just talked about is great, but if we lose it, where are we going to get it back? There's nowhere else to go. And what does he say? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. Do you fear losing your saltiness? The most obnoxious thing in the entire world, I heard one preacher say, and I absolutely believe this. The most obnoxious thing in the entire world is a Christian who is not Christ-like. Yes. More obnoxious than anyone who's in the world. The most terribly obnoxious and ugly thing ever is a Christian who's not being Christ-like. But the most tragic thing ever is a Christian who has lost his salt. You all think through this with me? If you're a Christian and you start to lose your salt, what does it mean? You're no longer preventing things. You're no longer preserving things. You're no longer enhancing things. And I'll just repeat this one more time. It's healthy for us just to, to, to catch the tragedy of this verse. If we lose our saltiness, what in the world could we do? And if we lose our saltiness, what is the world going to do? Because there's no one else to come in and salt it, right? So to close, let's just think of a few things here. 
If you have lost your saltiness as a Christian, be terrified and go get it back. Okay? I'm just going to throw out some principles here as we close this sermon. If you have lost your saltiness, read this verse. Be terrified and go get that saltiness back, whatever it takes. If you have never been salty as a Christian, go pursue it right now. Go be salty. I struggled with that for the first few months of my Christianity. I felt like I wasn't salty. I didn't get it. So if you feel that, if you, I was still dabbling in alcohol and things like that. If you feel that, if you know that, if you're like, I, I'm not affecting the world, I'm not salty, I'm not having this effect that we've talked about today, go pursue it now. Go get it back. And now you might ask me how. Here are just some, again, final principles I want us to think about. How do we get our saltiness back? One, be bold to say no as a Christian. Be bold to say no as a Christian. I've delighted in some, some brother and sister's uh, Facebook posts because w when we're on Facebook and we just say no to that, I love seeing that. When a Christian says no to something, that it's ungodly, that's getting your salty, saltiness back. Here's another thing. Be bold to say yes as a Christian. When we say, my God says I should have joy and I want it. I want it. I'm saying yes to it. I want it. My God says I should go to church. I want it. I'm saying yes to it. I'm saying yes to it. That's saltiness, right? Yes. How else can we get our saltiness back? Don't be embarrassed when other Christians say no or yes, right? Yes. If, you, if you say to me, I'm excited about going to church. I'm excited about prayer. I then need to say, I'm with you. Let's go, right? That's saltiness. When we're affirming what's good and going against what's evil. A few other things to get our saltiness back. Never underestimate the power of Christian witness. Just think about this and, and marvel in this. Martin Lloyd-Jones puts it this way. He says, think of the wonder of what happens when a true Christian walks in the room. The true Christian controls the whole atmosphere. The true Christian stops the tendency toward rot. The true Christian stops the putrefaction in the room. Have you ever noticed that? When you're at your job or something and, and people come to know you're a Christian. When you enter the room, they stop swearing. They clean up their act a little bit. That's us being salty. That's us saying, stop. Stop, world. Go no further. Right? Just revel in that. Think about that. Think about all of us going off to work and how we have that function. It's just incredible to think about. How else can we make sure to get our saltiness back? Two other things, and these are very important. Be bold to say no to the specific thing the culture is pressing you to affirm. Let me say that one more time. Be bold to say no to the specific thing the culture is pressing you to affirm. On this, I think next week, and I'd like us to talk about Roman Catholicism. That'll come up around the time of the Protestant Reformation, celebrating that again. You know, most Christians today say Catholics are Christians, and everything's just fine. Think about this just one more time here. Be bold to say no to the specific thing the culture is pressing us to affirm. That's what makes us salty as Christians. Right now, we have to say no to Roman Catholicism. Right now, Christians have to say no to homosexuality. Right now, we have to say no to transgenderism. Right now, we have to say no to Halloween. That's coming up next week. To preserve your saltiness as Christians, you have to say no to cigarettes. You have to say no to alcohol, to getting drunk. You have to say no to drugs. You have to say no to pornography. 
if you want to keep your saltiness. Yes. You have to say no to worldly entertainment. You all see that? Yes. Or else, what happens? The, is the salt loses its savor, right? And here's one final thing, and, and this is the point that convicted me most with the Lord in prayer on this specific verse. If you want to retain your saltiness, do not act as if your Christian glory days are behind you. What do I mean there? Do not act as if you used to be such a bright and shining Christian, but now, oh, I don't know, now I just, uh, I've just lost it. I used to be so strong in prayer, but now I've lost it. I used to care about evangelism so much, but now, well, it's okay. Right? I used to be passionate, fighting against sin, but now, oh, I don't know. The Christian who is salty should say, my glory days are in front of me. I'm getting more and more salty as I go. The path of the righteous winds upward as I go. Amen? I hope some of those principles would help us to stay salty, to become more salty, to affirm more and more what our Lord says right here. Ye are the salt of the earth. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this word is so clear. Please convict us with it. Lord, please help us go home and study your word. Help us be serious about the most serious thing in the world, who we are and what effect we're supposed to have on the world. Lord God, we bless your holy name. Amen.